But we do get to learn from great folks who, who get us in touch with what's going on in the world outside Kentucky. And one of those today is, is going to be wonderful for our first speaker. Let us welcome our first speaker, Thomas Hainig, a distinguished senior fellow at the Mercatus, Mercatus Center at George Mason University. He focuses on long-term impact of politicalization of financial services, as well as the effects of government-granted privileges and market performance. Political economics is something I've always been a believer in. Prior to joining the Mercatus Center, Mr. Uh, Hainig served as vice chairman of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation from 2012 until 2018. In that capacity, he oversaw the FDIC operations and policy related to deposit insurance pricing, bank supervision, financial stability, and bank resolution. He served as chair of the FDIC's bank appeals and audit committees and served as director of NeighborWorks America, which was established by Congress in 1978 to address housing issues nationwide. Let's welcome Mr. Thomas Haney. Thank you very much, and thank you all for this invitation. I want to thank Ballard and Nina, uh, especially Nina, for getting me here, uh, and uh, in this wonderful, in this wonderful place to uh, have a convention. Um, I also want to mention that part of the reason I'm here is Max Cook from the Missouri Bankers, who I've known for decades, and um, I spoke with the, his group for for a while on some of these topics, and uh, and I'm happy now to share some of the thoughts here today with you. I should point out I was also involved as president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City, and so while I'm going to talk about some of the regulatory issues, I'm also very happy to take any questions on uh, a very turbulent time now in the monetary policy field uh, as we look to the next several months uh, in our Q&A. So uh, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give the floor to you at that point. I want to talk about five of the challenges, there's many more, but five that I think are important to the K Kentucky bankers, community bankers, regional bankers in this area, and, and kind of make some suggestions on how you might think about it. Uh, I don't have solutions, if I did, uh, you would hire me for some, doing something else, but I do have suggestions for you. And I want to start uh, those five with the most obvious, and that is the regulatory burden that you must deal with. Uh, banking has been regulated since almost the start of banking, if not from the start of banking. So that's not necessarily new, but it has built over time. And with every crisis comes a new set of regulations and more cost to the banking industry, especially it falls hardest on the regional and community banks. And the best example of that, of course, is the most recent, and that's Dodd-Frank, which uh, just put numerous new rules and regulations on you. And I, as vice chairman of the FDIC, uh, know as well as anyone the nature of those rules and regulations and the, and the pressure that it places on the banking community uh, going forward. Uh, a study that was done, and I think it's a credible study by a, a group um, out of the um, uh, American Institute of Research, pointed out that the best estimate of the increased cost, the shift in cost for the industry as a whole, has been about $50 billion. Now, most of that falls, of course, on the largest banks since they have most of the assets, but because they have most of the assets, their unit costs are uh, at least manageable. But even as little as only $2 billion of that were to fall on the community banks or the remaining 4,700, that raises your cost, and you know this, uh, by hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not more, depending on your size. And I think that is something that you have to be aware of and, and, and think about as you go forward from here, as we move this forward. Because yes, uh, today's rules and regulations are not headline items, as they were then, but they still are yours to have to deal with. And over time, it really does take some of the vitality out of the banking industry, because as you have to deal with these costs and these increasing burdens of, of regulation, uh, it takes your time and energy. You spend more time in lawyers, consultants, and going through that. Now, my point here is that, yes, the most 
aggressive of you who deal with it, get your costs down and manage, but there's also the fact that you know there are gonna be more regulations in the future. Uh, we may be entering a recession. We don't know what will happen from that, but one thing that may come out of it, if anything goes wrong at all, will be more rules and regulations. So how to think about dealing with that in the future. My suggestion is, given that community banks and regional banks actually hold more capital than the largest institutions that were in a major way responsible for Dodd-Frank, that, that they should focus on arguing for fewer new rules that, have to requ that require lawyers and consultants and a straightforward capital requirement that if you do that, then we'll back off of some of these rules and regulation. And that means anticipating uh, the, 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 the pressures that are gonna come your way. And I think that could be a major help. And let me, let me ex explain why in the second point, and that is one thing I've learned is <clears throat> that when you um, think about it, okay, the amount of capital that you hold relative to the largest bank is pretty substantial. So by raising the capital requirements for the industry overall, have may, uh, my, less effect on you than the largest institutions. You hold between eight and 10% leverage capital, capital to assets, and the industry itself holds 6%, which I'll explain in just a second. That, that's not, not headlined, shall we say. And I think over time, the advantage of capital accelerates the consolidation of the industry. Because of course, if your cost of capital is less, you can do more of the acquisition, more of the expansion than can those who are subject to the higher standards. So in those cases, I think it's worth considering uh, how you approach the capital going forward. Let me give an example, and I think it's a little bit of the industry uh, in terms of the largest banks misleading because they report a 14% capital ratio, but that's a 14% capital to risk-weighted assets. And for the largest institutions, risk-weighted assets are less than half of their total assets. So if you take it in terms of the rules that you normally follow, that is the leverage ratio, capital assets, their ratio falls to closer to 6%. So their, their capital requirement is 6%, yours is 8 to 10%. If they were to have to raise theirs to yours, at least it would give you an even, a level playing field. So you would have, by pushing the capital strength, you would be able to argue that fewer regulations with stronger capital and having equitable capital, that is the uh, reasonably same capital over the banking industry, you as well as the largest, you can compete on a more level playing field. And I think that's extremely important because in the next, the next challenge you have, as the industry is changing, as we've seen the pressure on the community bank and the regulations that you face, we've seen non-bank industry begin to go after your market share. Small businesses have for generations reply, relied on the community bank for its lending, for its source of capital uh, over time. But as it becomes more pressure on you and more regulation on you, the non-banking sector has begun to try and address that because they have fewer regulations. And they also can go to the largest banks for the source of capital or the capital markets, which is easier for them than you. And the largest banks can lend to them at a lower cost because they have lower capital requirements, and therefore you are squeezed, and you probably see that more than I do every day. So we have to think about if you get these a better level, a, a more level playing field, your ability to compete in that market will improve, and that I think is extremely important. That leads me to the fourth challenge that you have with the industry, and that is the regulatory changes that are going on about you. I found it interesting that the uh, FDIC uh, and the, um, uh, the control of the currency put out a proposal that would say for regional banks, and my, I'd say regional banks, but it always flows down to the smaller community bank in time, where there would be a presumption in any type of merger that it is anti-competitive or it risks increasing the, uh, the financial instability of the institution, and so therefore it would be the burden of the bank merging, the banks merging, to convince the regulator that it would not be 
destabilizing or anti-competitive. Now, that's a complete reverse of what it is now, where you can merge unless they can show that it's somehow anti-competitive. Now, the antitrust laws have been in place for a long time, and it's not your fault if they don't, if they haven't enforced them. But now they want to make it a presumption that no, you cannot do it unless they say you can, rather than the other way around. That is a major change. And coincident with that, as you may have re read in this morning's paper, there's a proposal that would require the regional banks, and then with time, perhaps others, that you have to actually increase the amount of debt that you have in your bank, subordinated debt, so that you would be, so that that debt holder would take the first loss before the FDIC insurance. Now, the largest banks do that right now, and this would extend to you as well. Well, what do these things do? Well, the fact that it's harder to merge, and, and intuitively, I don't want to see the industry consolidate either, but the fact of the matter is, by doing that, it lowers the value of the bank's charter, because mergers are more difficult, and I think that is extremely important to keep in mind, and it protects the very largest banks. It puts a a competitive barrier around them in terms of anyone getting a scale that would be able to compete with those larger institutions. So it protects some, puts more pressure on the regional and smaller banks, and therefore gives more advantage to some over others, which I think is a challenge to the regional and community banks that should not be uh, left unaddressed as we go forward. The final challenge, and I think it's really the headline challenge right now, and that is the payment system. It is changing dramatically day by day. Uh, payments, I would say, uh, is the headline grabber. Uh, it's not just the mechanics of payments which is changing, and it is. We see it every day with different kinds of programs like Venmo. We're gonna see it in a, neck, in a year or so as FedNow, which is instant payment, uh, is uh, released, and therefore you will have the, the uh, clearinghouse, the 25 largest institutions who are going to be uh, able to clear instantly, and the Federal Reserve, which will clear instantly for you. But how will you approach that? How will your customer approach that? There are many risks with that. So how do you best, how, how do you best set that forward? It's an opportunity for the community bank because you have personal relationships with your customer, and that will be a major change. But then you have other competitors that come in. We have all know of, of cryptocurrency. We now know that we have stablecoin currency. And stablecoin currencies are petitioning strongly, and so are the cryptocurrencies, for access to clearing with the Fed. So that they have nowhere near the regulations you have, and they don't want any more regulation, but they also want access to clearing and settlement uh, so that they can go around the banking system as they clear in stable coins and so forth. And then you also have to anticipate a major push, I read about it every day now, for the introduction of central bank digital currency. If this is allowed to go forward, it will be a major change because it would allow individual citizens like myself or businesses to have direct retail or business accounts with the Federal Reserve, bypassing the banking system. Central bank digital currency is a major, major factor in the future, depending on how that evolves. And I know there are hearings going on uh, almost as we speak, and there is an effort among some in Congress to push that forward as a means to broaden access to payments uh, as, if, as if it were needed. So those, those are things that you have to keep in mind. Now, it's a risk, it's a challenge, it may be a threat, but it also is an opportunity. For I think if the regional community bank industry uh, thinks about this in terms of the kinds of service it provides, personal relationships with its customer, develops it and keeps current its banking system, or its payment system. Uh, now, one of your challenges is, many of you outsource it, maybe to Fiserv or whomever, they have to stay current so that you can stay current and provide these new systems, like access to FedNow and how it works, the safeties around that. But in doing that, I think you draw your customer closer to yourself. And I think that's extremely important. I would also point out 
that failing to do that means that the other cryptos, the stable coins, and the largest banks who will develop, who have the ability because they have a lower cost of capital to build their systems, will in fact make those digital payment systems available. A recent survey by the Wall Street Journal and the American Banker through the pandemic shows that more than 50% of people today use mobile devices for their payments instrument. So that, in, that market is changing, and that's a market that I think is yours to hold on to with the right uh, technology and innovations that come with that. So those are just five of the challenges. There are many more, but I think that your associations in terms of providing the, shall we say, the, the backing the innovation, the, the drive for improved payments for you would be extremely important. I saw your PAC systems in terms of the regulatory burden that has to be addressed, especially as it comes forward, and it will with you, they can help you there as well. It's a, it's a time of change, a time of challenge, and a time of opportunity. And I think that will become even more so uh, in the coming year as the economy itself changes, and as the Federal Reserve uh, begins to focus on inflation, which is the next big challenge for not just the banking industry, but for all of us. So with that, I'm gonna stop because I was told to keep it below a certain amount of time, but I'm happy to take questions and uh, love, to, love to hear from you. Thank you all very much. Morgan Ponger McGarvey is a mid-sized law firm that's long been known for its experience in banking and real estate law. But today we're much more than that. We've grown our legal practice to meet not only the needs of our institutional clients, but also the personal legal needs of the people behind those institutions. That's why we've expanded our practice to include family law, personal injury law, and trust and estates to name a few. There we go. Dr. Honig, you were talking about the innovation that's coming in the payment systems world. I know uh, China, Brazil have instituted electronic payment systems. I think government uh, or India and Brazil have. China now has its own digital currency. Right. Are we playing catch up in that area? Well, uh, first of all, China has experimented and in fact done some tests with central bank digital currency. And uh, some, some in the US who are promoting the, that the Federal Reserve engage in central bank digital currency argue that China's doing it, the world's changing, we have to do it too. All the other kids are doing it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's, but, and, and part of the reason they also give is because they, um, if you're gonna remain a, reserve, a global reserve currency, which the dollar is, you have to be able to do that. I disagree with that. The U.S., its status as a reserve currency will depend mostly on its industrial might and its financial system and the value of its financial system. Uh, the world pays now in digital dollars. We don't, we don't take cash and we don't move gold around. Most of us don't take cash across borders, but, uh, but we, don't, we don't move gold around. It, we do it digitally. So it's not necessary to have a central bank digital currency in order to settle internationally. So it's, that is a, what I call a, a, a false argument for it. It's not necessary. Uh, we have a very good payment system right now, a very good monetary system. Uh, and I think to make this, remember, if you go to central bank digital currency, you will disintermediate a big part of the banking industry, including the community banks especially as time goes on and more pressure is put on to build, have a deposit with the central bank rather than through your bank. So it is a major challenge should that proceed. Well, do you think a federally backed digital currency will become a reality? Um, not necessarily. I don't, I don't, since it's not absolute, well, since it's not necessary for the U.S. to be successful as a reserve currency, and it's not necessary for the development of the payment system, even, even uh, real-time payments. With FedNow, you're going to have that. So there's no necessity for it. But 
like you say, everyone else is doing it, we better do it too. <laughs> and I think that would be a, would really disrupt the banking system uh, over time. You mentioned stable coin. It really hasn't been that stable recently. Stable coin is, uh, is a misnomer. Uh, first of all, uh, it's primarily a money market with a payments element to it. Uh, it, it like, like the money markets itself, it says we, we'll back it with high quality um, assets, the dollar itself or a highly rated asset. And we know how that works. Over time, as you want to lever up, the quality of the asset backing it kind of deteriorates. You have a financial crisis. And if you have approved it, if, this, if the Federal Reserve has approved it and allows it access to the settlement system, then it becomes a bailout candidate. And I think that would be a terrible mistake. You, you mentioned the dollar still being the reserve currency. Uh, the U.S. GDP is now down to 40% of world GDP. But the dollar is, I've seen sources that say it's at a 20-year high, sources that yeah. say it's a 40-year high against the euro, the pound, the yen. Right. Is that why we're still the reserve currency? We're, we're still the reserve currency because we are the most reliable currency. Uh, you know, I, t I tell people, Sometimes it's like thinking about grading on the curve. You know, you, you have issues. We have, a, we're running major current account deficits. Uh, we have a, a possible recession, but in the scheme of things, we're still the best uh, yeah. among all the world currencies. And that's our major event. We have a market. We have a, uh, still a major, the major economy in the world. Uh, we have the rule of law that's uh, matched by no other part of the world. That's our advantage. And that, as long as we can maintain that and our economic might uh, still remains substantial, we'll remain a reserve currency. So we're basically a, a two-hole outhouse in a one-hole outhouse world, right? Yeah. We're, we're better than everybody. Let's bring it down to Kentucky. Yeah, let me, right. <laughs> let me jump over us on a question I've had forever, and I've always been a fan of yours uh, ever since 2010, actually, <laughs> yeah. since, uh, since you started voting no in the FOMC yeah. meetings. But the, uh, the, dual, the dual mandate, it, it, they can be very complimentary, I would imagine, if both parties did their job, if Congress right. did what they were supposed to do in the Fed. Right. But how in the world... It's in, very incongruent right now for for the Feds trying their best to stop inflation, and Congress is feeding it like a like a starving baby. Yeah. How, how, are, are we going to be able to keep that? Because they have to have. I mean, everything you see now, uh, the the Fed has to hope unemployment goes up. Well, <clears throat> first of all, in the dual mandate, they are complements, and the dual mandate is uh, to support both employment and stable prices. Uh, it's difficult now for two reasons. Number one is fiscal policy had been extremely expansionary. Between 2019 and 2020, the federal spending increased 50% in one year and maintained that for the next year, starting to moderate. It's still high, but it's not a 50% increase from 2019. Now it's only 30%, so feel better about that. And so. You, ha you have that going on. Now, what that does, though, is there they did not want to increase taxes, okay? So that means they borrowed that funds. To keep interest rates from going up, the Federal Reserve bought the debt, actually monetized the debt. And that, with the spending of the federal government going up by 50%, and the monetizing of the debt that allowed that to go up, so the money was put out there, you get the inflationary impact. So now it would be, it, it, it will be painful regardless, but it would, I think, be more manageable if both the fiscal side and the monetary side moderated, that is the, the fiscal side moderated spending more than it is right now. And the monetary side uh, did not buy all that debt, did not force to buy all that debt. Interest rates will go up. We will have a slowing in the economy. Uh, and it doesn't have to necessarily be a recession, but if only the Federal Reserve does it, interest rates will go, have to go up that much more. And I think the, the likelihood of a recession is extremely high 
right now, I really do think it is, you know, by first of next year, we would probably have a pretty good recession going on. That's a guess, but if they raise this week, if they raise the Fed funds rate another three quarters of a percentage point, and they do it again in November, we'll be close to them by then three and three quarter percent. One more time in December, over 4%. <clears throat> That's a, uh, like, uh, almost 20%, uh, 18% increase, or 18 fold increase in interest rates in a year. That's a, that's a big shock to an economy. And, no, and so the unemployment rate will begin to rise. And that'll put enormous pressure on the Federal Reserve to stop it. And that's where you get the Paul Volcker analogy. Will the current chairman and the FOMC hold fast to their increased rates and suffer through a recession to get inflation down, or will they back off of that? So based on your experience, do you think they'll get it right or not? I think it will be very difficult for them. Um, I think they're very determined right now. They really are determined. And that's why we'll see the three quarter percent. But right now, the one advantage they have is unemployment is low. If the unemployment rate were to take off and move higher quickly, which is a possibility, that's how it often happens, then I think more pressure will come from the public and much more pressure will come from the Congress to back off. And that's when we'll, we'll find out just how committed they are to it. I, the track record of the Fed is not the best in sticking to it. They either, and when I say not the best, I think they should get their rate up and hold it. They, their mistakes have always been they go too high or they back off too soon. So, you know, like the porridge store, you got to get it just right. And that's, uh, that's a tough, that's a tough uh, job. It's an art, art as opposed it, it, to it's, it's not a science at all. It is an okay. art. Uh, I, I hope they, what they do is get it. So the, the, the interest rate, if they get it above 4%, and the core inflation comes down closer to four, and they leave it at four for a period, they might be able to draw it down without a major crash. Uh, if they go higher than that, and the inflation comes down quicker than that, and they don't adjust, then we could have a crash. So they are really walking a tightrope, uh, and I don't envy them the task, but I'm, I'm more concerned that they will back off too quickly. That's what they did in the 70s, and we had inflation that was 9%, it went back down, the unemployment rose, they backed off. Before they finally stuck to the guns, inflation was 14%, and that's what we want to avoid. I was talking with someone this morning who was mentioned just kind of as a rule of thumb that interest rates, in order to preserve value of assets, almost need to equal inflation rate. Yeah, the, the historically, and, but you have to be careful of this. Historically, to bring inflation down, the interest rates have to be higher than inflation. So you have to get your numbers up. But remember, too, most of the, in those, most of those instances, that's when you did trigger a recession. Yeah. So the real question is, can you get it up high enough, anticipating if you get it high enough that it will, inflation will slow and begin to come down and leave it there? to when inflation then falls back down before you bring it down to more of a neutral. And that's the art that they have to practice and it has been very difficult for the open market committee to do. There's no, there's no rule in, you know, the, the Federal Reserve, the U.S. went off the gold standard in 1971. That left all discipline in the hands of the Federal Open Market Committee. And therefore there's nothing binding. So it's all discretionary and it can change from one time to another. And that's the challenge that they face because they're gonna, right now, everyone is for getting inflation down and raising interest rates. But once the unemployment rate starts to rise, that will change. And we'll see then what the Federal Reserve Open Market Committee will do. You were talking about the politicalization of the market. Uh, do you see anything changing once we get past the midterms? No, I don't. It's. It's a, it's a trend that has been going on for decades. And when I say the, polit the politicization, I mean the fact that more and more um, 
is going through and changing through legislation, one favored over another. For example, um, <clears throat> if you are, uh, the fact that you have this pact, what, when, I, when I started uh, at the Federal Reserve, there, there were lobbyists, of course, but now the amount of lobbying that has to go on, uh, I think there's 15,000 lobbyists right now in Washington. That's like a threefold increase in just my career. And so the, that, the need to have that political influence is growing every year. And whether it's, for example, I was, I was surprised uh, by the fact that the FDIC put out a proposal that said, we are going to now, we, we're proposing this rule that says, if a regional bank merges with another regional bank, the presumption is it's, it's anti-competitive and could be systemically destabilizing. And you have to show us. Well, that, that's, you know, that's amazing. And when the, when the lobbyists get done with that, what will we have? Will, will they be able to stop it? But it's not the market who's saying, you know, how mergers should take place. It's the regulatory body or it's lobbyists going to Congress to say, no, we want the law changed this way. Another example is the, the changes that are going on in the payment system we talked about. The crypto industry has a huge lobbying offer right now to gain access to settlement. Uh, it's private money. And I say, fine, if you want to be private money, be private money. And you're, you're a parallel system. So once you get into the government side of things, you're now regulated by the government, therefore you'll be protected by the government. What do the lobbyists want? They want the protection because it allow them to scale up. So that's more of the politicization of the financial system. Uh, the capital markets are the same way. So we're more and more of it's being accomplished through rules being written and by the Congress itself, not through the markets, not through innovation. Uh, it's, it's this uh, influence. Well, will, always, will Fed now provide community banks a way to compete more successfully in that payment industry? I think so. I think so. And it, it will at least add, give you an option. Right now, it's the clearinghouse, which is the 25 largest banks, uh, say they have a uh, real-time settlement system. It's more or less that. But if that is the only one, and, and you, you know, to build a clearing system is a, a huge undertaking. So you're not going to be easily able to do it on your own. So that would be your choice. And they would set the, the, the parameters around which you could access it and the, and the price that you would access. So with Fed now, you have a choice. And, and you will, as bankers, have a choice to join the uh, real-time payments with all its advantages and its risk. But at least you have a choice. And then I think that's extremely important going forward. So, uh, and it, had they not done that, you would, you would probably ended up a little bit like you're seeing in some of the credit card with uh, regulating prices, which I don't recommend. Let me jump over real quick. You were talking about some of the regulatory challenges and basically talking about tailoring regulations, which we've been trying to do forever yeah, right. and have not been successful. What, what makes you think that we could possibly be successful going forward? Well, it'll, it'll be a challenge. It's not something that's easy. But my, my point is, you know, Dodd-Frank, huge piece of, I mean, huge piece of legislation. Thousands of pages in the bill itself and then tens of thousands of pages in the regulations. And when, when this crisis emerged, one of the, there were many, many causes to it, but one of them was the largest institutions had less than 3% capital to their assets. It was so levered that it was only a matter of time when we would have a crash. So my point is, bring, and, you know, regional and community banks have, about 8%, 9%. So it, 
So bring them up, at least bring the largest up since they're over half the assets of this country. And then argue the point that, wait a minute, we don't need you to tell us, your example earlier, that you have to, you have to show cash flow before you can make a loan. No, your capital is at risk. We know how to make loans. Let us do that and we'll do it responsibly. And we have capital, our own money at risk. It will give us a greater accountability. So let's go forward with that and argue with those in Congress that that is a better solution than a multi-thousand page piece of legislation that costs billions of dollars to implement. Now, whether you can influence the legislate, legislators, you know, that's where the lobbying comes in and the, and, the, and the education, but you have to try. Otherwise, you're going to be saddled. And I think, as you put this burden on you, I mean, I have noticed, when I was at the FDIC, you had very few new charters. And we had a lot of the consolidations going on. Now, part of it may be scale, may be on its own. But part of it is, I cannot, the banker's saying, I cannot manage the regulatory uh, complexities that have been hoisted on me going forward. I don't have the wherewithal that the largest banks have to hire the lawyers, the consultants, to manage through this and, and hire my own staff. So it's, it's driving, you know, people say, well, we, we don't need 4,000 banks. Well, maybe we don't. But that's not the same, you know, if, if, the market, if the market says that, that's one thing. But if you're driving out with regulatory burden, that's a different answer. And so why not give banks a chance? This country has been the most innovative. I've had so many people compare us to Canada and say, well, they have more stable. And I said, yeah, but they're nowhere near as competitive. We have benefited from this competition. And that's what we need to convince the lawmakers that there is there, there is a benefit. Failure is not the worst thing. Failure is not the worst thing. What the worst thing is, no industry. That's my point. I always find it right comical that every time there's a catastrophe, the FDIC comes out and says, okay, we're going to do away with all these rules, yeah. and we're going to let the banks get back to doing what they're doing so they can get their communities back up and running. Right. And as soon as we do that, then it's okay. Now we're going to put the rules back on top right. of you. It just sounds crazy. Well, okay, so anytime you have a anytime you have a bureaucracy like that, it reacts to it, re, it reacts to public pressure or to congressional pressure. So when when you have the crisis and you're rebuilding it, the congressmen they all say, "Well, we we need to have our communities back," so they're pushing that forward. When the banks start to fail, suddenly it's the bank's fault. It's not monetary policy's fault that uh, printed too much money, caused inflation, and required this. It's the bank's fault, and therefore you get more regulation. And I, I find it, um, I, I find it uh, understandable, but it also needs to be changed if we're going to have a vibrant a vibrant commercial banking industry, not a highly concentrated one. I think back on Dodd-Frank when most of Dodd-Frank was only supposed to apply to banks 10 billion and above. Of course, we right. know how that turned out. Right. And now I'm listening to them talk about 100 billion and above on SEC, on, on environmental and social governance issues. Right. On D. There's no chance that stays that way. That runs downhill as fast as it can get there. It, it always does. It, it is, you know, just like you're seeing now, you started with required leverage in the largest banks. And I'll tell you something else about that, though. But and then now it's at the regional. Well, you know where it goes next, because that, you know, they say, well, you know, my point is, why not get the largest banks to raise more equity? Number one, it's they, equity holders always are the first loss. It protects the FDIC every bit as much as debt. It, if you do get into a tight cash flow, you don't have to pay dividends, you know, but with debt, if you don't, you're, you're, you're uh, insolvent. So, you know, why not uh, allow the banks to have the, raise the capital, not have to leverage unless they choose to and not can meet the standards. But right now we're seeing that 
required leverage going for regional banks and eventually come for other. Now, one of the things that will be a, something for you to think about, with the largest banks right now, there's two pricing models for your deposit insurance premiums. There's the large bank and then banks. For holding this debt, they get in the calculation for the premium, they get a, a what I'll call a break in terms of their premium because that's, that's the first loss. And I'm thinking, so now the fund has fallen below 1.35. So they are proposing raising the assessments on all banks. If the largest banks didn't have the break for the debt, how, how much less would you have to pay into assessment? So those are the sorts of things that come. It's, it's also the hidden issues that come with these proposals out there. And, and who, has the, who has the time to technically read these things? It, they're extremely complex. Uh, and so it's another challenge for the community bank in its, in its effort to survive. You mentioned the number of lobbyists in Washington. Uh, they obviously have a great deal of influence. Yeah. But most of them are representing the big banks you're talking about. Right. How do regional banks, community banks, have input into the U.S. Congress and the regulatory agencies that you suggest we need? Well, part of it is what, what, you, what I heard today. I mean, you've got to have your own PACs. You've got to... You have to build it you, and, and, and have knowledgeable people. The largest banks do, they can afford these lobbyists and they, they pay them well. I mean, the Bank Policy Institute, which is a research group in Washington, is an arm of the clearinghouse. Uh, and so they do, they do some you know, work. It always comes out in somehow to to uh, support the largest banks. Uh, and so that's part of what the community banks, that's part of what the community banks have to do within the ABA or whomever uh, to make sure you have, number one, the money. And that's hard. I mean, think about it. When you look at the, 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 the uh, money for lobbying that's spent, uh, the largest banks are huge givers. Uh, so you, you have to, you have to accumulate the resources, and then you have to acquire the knowledge, uh, and then you have to apply it. And uh, easier said than done, but absolutely essential if, if this industry is going to remain a strong competitive industry at the local level. When we think of lobbying, we traditionally think of it in regard at the federal level, at least to, to the U.S. House and Senate. Right. How much lo lobbying influence is there at the regulatory agencies, at the FDIC, at the Fed? It's not as it's 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 not as direct. Although, you know, the the largest banks make sure they stay in touch with the regulatory agencies, um, but it's not as direct. But where it does play out is in in the largest banks lobbying the Congress or the bank you know, the banking committees. Uh, those individual members, they write letters, you know, asking questions, uh, raising concerns to, with the agency. Uh, that's how they do it. Uh, they do it through their lobbyists to the Congress, who then uh, puts pressure on the agencies themselves, individual members. Going back to the agencies, I remember one time I had a particular concern about a new regulation that was coming out that I didn't think made particular sense. And I called the chief of staff for a U.S. senator who was a good friend of mine and was railing about this. And he said, now, John, you don't understand. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, we here at the U.S. Congress see a need. So we pass a law. And we delegate regulatory authority to the uh, Federal Reserve, the FTC, right. the FDIC. General counsel takes it over. General counsel then goes to general counsel's legal staff that just graduated from some of the better right. law schools in the country, have not one day of experience of real world in their life, and they produce a set of regulations 
that's adopted by the board that has the force and effect of U.S. law Correct. behind it. Correct. Is there any truth to that's, that? That's, that's very true. I, I, the, yes, it's true. The, when, when they passed Dodd-Frank and these thousands of pages, it was most of the implementation, most of the detail was delegated to the agencies. And I spent hours debating issues about banks, whether for the largest bank, whether the living will was done correctly or for small banks, you know, uh, you know what, what the disclosure requirements were going to be with lawyers. Now, there were some very experienced lawyers, but it was the agencies. And then you, you had to get all the agencies to agree. So it became a legislative process within the regulatory administrative state. It became a legislative, they had to negotiate with one another, they had to put these rules forward, and then they did it in great detail. So that's how uh, these, these regulations come down on to the banking industry. So uh, saying something like that, would you, I, I, I feel lately as if the most important thing that's happened to, to banking in the last 20 years was the EPA West Virginia ruling on the Chevron case. Right. That that sort of open, that, that opens up, and now it, it only applies to the EPA at this point, right. but it opens up that Congress has to do your, you have to go back to doing your job. Right. You cannot let the regulators have free reign interpreting what you said. Right. And I, I am so hoping that our industry starts using that at every turn. Well, it's a, it's a big deal. The Chevron decision which is what we're talking about, because that decision the Supreme Court gave some year, many years ago now, pretty much left it in the hands of the, of the regulatory body, and that's the so-called administrative state. And it was defining the rules for you. And what, that's, what this most recent case on the Virginia case, if that spreads, then it says, wait a minute, no, if, you know, you have to be instructed by the Congress what to do, they have to make that decision. That means they're going to have to be a lot more detail in, in, the, in the legislative process itself, which may be your greatest saving factor for uh, unruly regulation. And I, I, I agree with you. I hope it does. I, I hope it does become increasingly dominant uh, in terms of reversing the Chevron decision over time. When you, when you think about what the, what, what, Mr. Grunberg just did with the FDIC and doing away with the uh, fair and balanced uh, review board. Yes. Oh. And, and putting back in judge, jury, and executioner uh, as himself. <laughs> this at least puts more of the responsibility on people that you know. Yeah. I, I, um, I guess everyone's aware of that, how, how that happened. I mean, the, the, FD, the FDIC just, they had this rule. Um, they had the committee, I was on that committee when I was there, regular, of supervisory appeals. And it was staff driven. Um, and the, the uh, appealing party had a right to, to a hearing. I mean, you I listened to them, but the staff, the FDIC, a board, all won, they made the decision. So when they went outside and had a third party at least you had a sense of balance. And then uh, Grunberg then removed that and you're back to the old way of doing things. And I, I think that is unfortunate. I think it's very unfortunate. Um, and we'll see if someone challenges that at some point. But it likes, like so many things, it was very expensive to challenge. And they their budget's different than your budget. We're talking about federal regulation of banks and financial institutions. Obviously, there's regulation at the state level, sure. but you have really 53 states when you include Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, Guam. Uh, what, what do you see as trends in the panoply of state regulation of banks? I, th I, I don't... Well... <laughs> It will be all over the map because it'll vary by the by the politics of those states. But I would say that um, 
the more progressive states will put increasing burdens on banks, yeah. will demand more of the, uh, even, even, on the even on a national scale. Uh, for example, uh, you know, these cases where you're using bank, if you go to, if you go to real time payments, for example, uh, the, the CFPB and some of the states, California, for example, would say if they make a mistake, it's the bank's fault. So if I pay someone incorrectly and it's instantaneous, it's final payment, um, and I want my money back, I, I didn't mean to make that mistake. It's now your mistake, yeah. and you have to re Those are the sorts of differences you'll get across the states, uh, and it's expensive. It will be expensive. So I, I think you cannot ignore the state and what it, its regulatory environment is. You mentioned CFPB. That's the first time that, that agency has come up this morning. One of my issues with the CFPB is uh, a story I sometimes tell is the examiners come into a bank and the chief examiner meets with the president and says, I'm very sorry, but you have a UDAP. And the president says, I can't imagine we have a great compliance problem what sort of UDAP do we have? And the chief examiner says, I'm not sure, but I think we'll find one. <laughs> because, and, and there, I, I'm, I tell a story about that, but on the other hand, UDAP is essentially what they think it is at any given moment in time, as opposed to what I call bright line standards. Right. Give us bright line standards and we'll comply, right. but don't give us this amorphous standard of UDAP. I, I, I'm aware of that story, and there is um, there is truth to it. In this, uh, for example, I have I have seen I have witnessed firsthand instances where the person says, "I can't show it exactly, but I feel that they're doing that," <laughs> and that's the same thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and that's where the rule of law comes in. If we lose that. Yes, I don't care if you feel it or not. You have to be able to show it, and most of the time you you can't because there isn't there isn't that violation. So that's a major issue coming forward with these regulatory expansion of authorities that come through Dodd Frank type legislation that generally says thou shalt not, but you you regulatory agency you 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 just you define what thou shalt not is. Yeah. And that's a real danger going forward. A classic example, that's what we were talking about earlier in Dodd-Frank. It was simply said, you have to prove ability to repay. Right. Well, every banker in the country started laughing when they saw that because what bank makes a loan that they don't think right. they get paid back? Right, you don't, you don't, you're not a charitable institution. Right, and, and it goes to the regulatory agency and some young lawyer fresh out of school says, oh, well, I think that means you have to show cash flow. Right. I, I, um, I'm concerned about that. I mean, I understand the three C's. I do think that um, banks ha have to be allowed to take risk. And the FDIC, more and more, is risk avoidance. Uh, and then the controller as well. But the FDIC, because of its fund, I guess, uh, are risk avoidance. But you have to allow banks to take risk. And, and your judgment has to be on the quality of the bank's management and their systems and the quality of their asset as you review it over time. Um, but when you say uh, you have to show in advance the cash flow history, then you have a problem. And that's when we'll, that, that's, you know, that's, what, that's when you turn to outside parties, right? To the non-banks who don't have to show that because they're not regulated in the same way. And their sources of fund are through the capital markets and through and the then, largest banks. And then the borrowers paying credit card rates. Right? Absolutely, very substantial. The perfect example is, uh, is telling banks to, to, you increase your leverage to increase your safety. I yeah, yeah. That wasn't in graduate school example. when I was there. Right. I don't, uh, maybe they've changed. I, I think having the, large, having the largest banks and then eventually I think medium-sized banks are down have a requirement of subordinated de debt in their bank as a f is, is absolutely um, irresponsible. If a bank wants to lever 
and has a capacity on its own, then that's one choice. But if you have to lever uh, because you want, they want you to, to be the first, and then you get into a recession and your cash flows go down, they will then have their own dilemma. Do I allow you to pay out to cover that and deplete my equity to keep from going bust or do I not and bust you now while you still have the equity? I, I don't see any upside to that. No. no. What do the people in this room do to have greater input? You probably never equivalent to the 10 largest banks in, in the country, but, but what do the people in this room who are down there at street level taking care of Main Street businesses do to have the input they need in this process? Well, I think, look, we, we all have our local congressman. You have to spend time. He's about to be on this stage. Yeah, I, I saw that <laughs> on the program. But they have to, they have to be aware. And it, and it can't be generalities. I mean, it has to be specifically what your issue is. And that's why I said, on, even on Dodd-Frank, what part of it you know, do, you, do, do you simplify uh, or eliminate? Uh, that's an example. Uh, I think on the capital differential, I, I think the difference in the capital standards that you have with the largest banks is really quite substantial. I mean, we're talking 40, 50 percent difference in your leverage ratio. That's a huge cost of capital difference. I'd never heard that before yeah. this morning. Yeah, is that right? Well, I've got the I've got the charts. I mean, it's six percent leverage for them. Oh, it's, I consider myself educated <laughs> now. <laughs> but I, yeah, it's very important that that be aware that you be aware of that, uh, and that the congressman be aware of that. I think risk. I say this advisedly, but I think risk-weighted capital measures are a form of fraud. I mean, when you report 14% capital and it's really six, because you're saying, well, yeah, but we're waiting. Give you an example. If you make a loan, it's 100% weight, right? If they package loans and call it a CLO, collateralized loan obligation, it's a security, and it's a 20% weight. Holy cow. Yeah. What an advantage. Those are the sorts of things that have to be understood and explained because it really does uh, change the dynamics of the market and your competitive position within the market. One yeah. of the things that I have noticed in, in large banks on some of their large revolving credits, I'm talking about seven, eight figure revolving yeah. credits, is they're now making them on a demand basis instead of a term basis. I've been told that relates to the reserve requirements. Is that something big banks are doing? Well, I, it, it, yes. What, well, I, I can't tell you, the, I necessarily know the reason for it, but I do know that as reserves have built, banks have, the largest banks have shortened the, the, their liability structure yeah. and their deposits. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, Banking and demand really shortens. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, and I would also say that um, as as the as the Fed begins to do what's quantitative tightening, removing those the the, the lines of credit that they receive the fee on, those will be called, and that's when then the real capital pressure will come on those large banks and be disruptive. So, I mean, these. These rules have consequences, and you know we all know leverage is a two-edged sword, but quantitative easing and quantitative tightening, quantitative easing, you just put the money out there, here's the consequence, you get inflation down the road, asset inflation, not quantitative tightening, it it's really can be quite devastating. So some of those demand facilities might get called. Not might be, they yeah, will be will. called. <laughs> and um, then, those loans will go on their books. They'll have pressure on their capital, so they won't be able to maintain other um, yeah, loan that relationships. Point they got a classified asset. Yeah, classified asset. There will be short capital, so they will not be making loans. There'll be pressure on you. It's. Um, I think I think I've seen this movie. 
I, I, said uh -huh. it, I said at the opening, you were my hero. And, and I want to explain to everybody why is because it, the, uh, when, when you were president of the Kansas City Fed, you were on the FOMC. Right. And historically, they vote in unison, 12 0, just right. on everything. And, and when quantitative easing started and they started flooding the market with money, you were the one no vote. And nobody really understood uh, I, it, the, until they released the records. I think it was a, what, a five year right. waiting period. And then when they released the records, and I was reading about what you were saying in the process uh, of, as why you were voting no, uh, we, we find ourselves today exactly where you said we would find ourselves 12 years ago. Yeah. I, I uh, thank you for mentioning that, but my concern, yes, with quantitative easing was, you, you, you flood, the, you flood the, the economy with money, you flood the banks with money, you lower the interest rate to zero. You, you, you lower the interest rate below the return on capital, therefore you begin, to, you invite it speculation, which is what they did. And that's why you saw asset values rise. Uh, housing became unaffordable for some. Uh, the stock market boomed, and if you had stock, you were great, but if not, you were out of luck. But it also created inefficiencies, caused um, losses in terms of the productivity in the economy because of the zero interest rate. And you established an a very fragile equilibrium around zero interest rate and money. And now that you have the price inflation, they're paying attention to it, even though we've had a decade of asset inflation, now you have to reverse that. And the reversal will be very, very painful. And my concern was once you start down the, the quantitative easing, you can't withdraw it easily. And, and you know, the, t the tantrum in 2013, the, the, the 2019, September 2019 repo crisis uh, are all part of the effects of quantitative easing that started in 2010. Well, I took notes. And one of the three things that hit me that you said in your, in, in, inside those meetings was it, that it would deepen income inequality. Right. We're there. Uh, it would stoke dangerous market bubbles. We're seeing that over the last <laughs> few years. And it, it really just sucks the Fed into a, a, a money printing quagmire. Right. And that's where we are. And they, they can't get out of it easily. And it, will, it, it is going to be painful. I wish I could say it's going to be magic. We're going to have a soft landing. I don't, I, if we do, wonderful. But the odds are very, very small that it will be a soft landing. Well, thank you for sticking to your gun. Well, thank you for, <laughs> thank you for thank being you. with us today. You thank are, you for inviting me. I, 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 I really very much enjoyed it. And thank you all for having me. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Have a great day.